this is uh, your gene. This is your genes are trying to tell you something. Are you listening? And uh, so this is me. Why am I talking about genetics? My uh, what I enjoy is is helping health minded entrepreneurs, moms, uh, mompreneurs, and other leaders find optimal health in their bodies. I work with other people uh, also, and uh, the reason why that I make a special mention for mompreneurs, uh, moms, and entrepreneurs is that one of the reasons why I got into this entire field of functional medicine is because I was ra uh, raised by a really uh, stressed out single uh, mom and entrepreneur or we call mompreneur. So she and I have uh, really worked on and, and healed our relationship over the past 30 years. And we're really close friends now. But in the beginning, by her own admission, she did not make the best decisions on my behalf and how she raised me uh, be because of just everything that was happening. So my the way that I, in air quotes, and the karma of what the stress and everything I grew up with was that I make a special outreach to helping moms and entrepreneurs so that another child of that setup isn't um, hurt in the same way, the same way that I was. And uh, I had gone through a long journey of going into functional medicine and uh, genetics uh, is a major piece of that. It's, it's one of the newer pieces in functional medicine. And there's a lot that can be learned from genetics that you can't find in other types of tests. And if you're here, it probably means you're very curious about natural health. And you've probably dealt with the things that I've dealt with, like confusion about diet, wanting to know, uh, curious to know what's going on about genes and health. And you tried everything that only seemed to work for other people, but not yourself. This is what I had this in spades, what uh, people would, I tried, I call it magic bullet therapy. People would come to me with this goji berry juice that you insufflate up your nose or this, this special diet or this, this meditation technique. No, it's, no, it's this thing, that thing, that thing. And I believed their personal stories of how they were helped and they insisted that this was the one true way to get back to my health and my experiences. It wasn't like that. And what I found was that certain people, certain things work because it happened to be this happy sense of fortuitous circumstance where they found the thing that filled in the gap that their unique combination of environment and genetics what created the gap for it, for which to, to be filled by said magic bullet. But that wasn't the thing, the combination that I need for that said magic bullet. Now, one thing that uh, we do have is, is the wonders of Zoom is that we can do wonderful interactions. Uh, Crystal is going to be monitoring the chat and that um, that's... What we're going to do is share a lot of helpful info. We're going to have a really nice Q&A section at the end. Questions go in the chat. Even if, um, if you have a question that comes up during the presentation, don't, don't hold on to it. Just, just put it in the chat so you can continue to stay present with the rest of the presentation. And we'll get back to those questions. Uh, and yeah, Crystal will we'll monitor those. And now the other thing we'll do is that at the end of the presentation, for those that stick around, we're gonna be handing out a really nice prize for people that stay. It's a very, very nice high value tool that I'll be handing out um, that normally sells for 300 US for uh, people that stay and ideally for those that, that interact. Now, uh, one thing that we're just gonna alert you to is that this is not a conversation about 23andMe or Ancestry or what, you know, I, I'm not interested in what percentage Irish you are. Some of you may be, but that's not my interest. Uh, it's, this is about genes and health, not, not, oh, look, I have some red hair. I wonder if I'm Irish, you know, like, it's not, it's not like that. We're, we're not getting into that type of thing. Uh, what we are going to talk about is the genetics for health. Uh, particularly around how to quote unquote, stop the clock on the effects of aging. And 
we're also going to kind of pull back the veil and uh, why why mainstream genetics testing doesn't really tell you that much about your actual unique predispositions on your health. Uh, my The other things you'll learn are the three different types of weight gain. So there's three different genetics types of weight gain. So if you've been trying to lose weight and not been able to, you may be dealing with one or more one or more of the three genetic uh, blockades to losing weight. So if you understand your genetics, then you can actually target the stubborn weight in a unique, ineffective way. The other thing is, uh, we'll talk about how to future proof your brain. Now, why do I talk about future proofing your brain? Well, I have dementia and Alzheimer's on both sides of my family, including my father, who is going through dementia right now. And so this is uh, relevant to me. And I'm sure to many of you, you have uh, family members that or friends or, or family members of friends that are undoubtedly going through neurodegeneration um, or are, or even just something as simple as brain fog. Uh, genetics will reveal quite a lot. The other is looking at the fun thing about genetics is that it can share or rather reveal why some healthy choices that you think may be good for you are actually possibly counterproductive. And so uh, one example is that you can now genetically test for optimal diet in terms of, are you a keto, a paleo, a Mediterranean or a high carb? So a lot of people may think, oh my God, I'm going keto, I'm super healthy, yet you feel terrible on it. And then you get keto shamed for not, that's a new word, TM. We should write that down, Crystal, keto shame. Um, you get keto shamed. I actually probably should trademark that. That's pretty funny. Um, you get keto shamed for not being keto enough. And there's many reasons why people may not do well on keto. Uh, they're kind of just to be slightly nerdy. I know that's off brand for me, but just to be slightly nerdy. Uh, one reason why people may not do well on keto is that uh, their carnitine shuttles are messed up. So their ability to move fats into the mitochondria is not working. They're not actually to use fat for energy or their mitochondria are busted. And that's where you need a mitochondria test to see like you need your mitochondria to work in order to burn fat and live off of fat. Or another reason is that your digestion is totally shot and you can't absorb fats. And so it's your gallbladder is off or your pancreas it spits out the lipases to break down fats after the gallbladder, the, the bile has emulsified the fats. So it could be a digestive issue or it could be genetic, genetic in the sense that you don't have a, you don't have a low carb tolerance. You have a very high carb tolerance. So high fat genetically doesn't work for you. I'm a very, very low carb person. So high fat really works well for me. Assuming I've got my carnitine shuttle, my mitochondria, my gallbladder and my digestion and my, my pancreas working properly. So the healthy choices, this is the difference between um, statistical based health recommendations based on bell curves and populational studies, which are very useful and personalized health based on personalized functional testing that because you are not a bell curve. You're not that you there's, there's all sorts, there's, there, there's all sorts of stuff. Um, and that makes you unique. So this is where genetics testing is a big part of that. Now, there's a joke, uh, two genomes walk into a bar. Uh, I says, I'll have my mRNA transcribed, not, not stirred. Ha ha. <laughs> then there's uh, the two genomes walk into a coffee bar. Now, one of the genetics tests that we do is um, food intolerances, looking at your genetic vulnerability to gluten, lactose, and dairy, alcohol, salt, histamines, food, other food allergens, and coffee. So for me, I turns out I am genetically sensitive, genetically vulnerable to coffee and caffeine in, in what sense? I am prone to caffeine-induced anxiety and depression. I'll say that again, caffeine-induced anxiety and depression. So there's a certain population of which I am one that caffeine is kryptonite to me. 
uh, I may wake me up, but I'm a jittery, depressive mess. And it doesn't matter how much coconut oil or cinnamon I add to that thing. It's the caffeine still really messes me up. So the genetics test really held my feet to the fire because I was living in denial. I was making the most bulletproof coffee ever. You know, I think I counted 13 ingredients I added to my coffee to try to make it this like virtuous health drink, you know, and I was still like an anxious mess, you know, 90 minutes later. And it was the genetics that's like, hey, uh, no amount of coconut oil is going to overcome your genetic vulnerability here. And that rat, so that, that's one of the ways this genetic testing radically improved my life. Now, this is my, no, no, the most important thing about this, this is the most important slide for this entire presentation is that you meet my dog, Lily. That's it. I admit it. This was all a ruse. This, this whole genetic thing, my education, the doctorate, all the certifications, it was all a ruse just to show you this picture of my dog. We just turned two, and here she is in the fur. This is Lily Bear. Say hi, Lily. Hi, Lily. Okay, so that's it. We can end the slideshow now. I'm now complete. All right, and scene. All right, so that's my dog, Lily. She's turned two this past Sunday. She's super adorable. Um, she's the cutest dog ever, not because she's my dog, but because it's true. It's true. That's why. All right. Glad we settled that. It's a good thing everyone's on mute because no one can debate. All right. So what is genetics testing? So what is genetics testing anyway? That's a really hard pivot, Crystal, to that slide. That is a super hard pivot to go from my dog to genetics testing. Um, okay, focus. A collection of five different cutting. It's, it's helpful to have words on the screen to help me say the things to get me out of my, my dog's and thinking about my dog. All right, collection of five different cutting edge tests that give you a clear insight genetic predispositions for your health. All right, so the, the, the genetics things we're talking about is we're looking at diet, uh, it's, vit it's actually, sorry, that's vitamin D absorption, uh, not vitamin C, uh, vitamin D absorption. Uh, there's, there's 11 genes, so just, just to get people understanding, there's 11, there's eight genes that stand between you're the sun and making vitamin D in your eight, eight major genes from sunlight to vitamin D in the blood. And then there's three others that make vitamin D in the blood to get into the cells. So there's 11 total genes. That mean does sunlight translate to vitamin D affecting your actual cells? Uh, that's what that's talking about. Food sensitivities. Uh, one, we just, we just mentioned that caffeine, alcohol, lactose, salt, alcohol, uh, histamine, and other food allergens. Then there's uh, the carb, the carb tolerance, this is the ideal diet. Are you keto, paleo, Mediterranean, high carb? And then there's a whole other smattering of things in what in the, uh, in the big, big genetic panel, which is the future proof your brain slash, um, uh, stop the clock of the effects of aging slash health and well-being slash all that. It, this is the, it covers inflammation, free radical damage liver detoxification, cardiovascular health, fat and energy metabolism, uh, so on and so forth. Now, here are some of the clues. If, you're, if your genes are trying to tell you something, um, the, 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 the clues are, uh, are you doing things that you're doing, having the exact same lifestyle as someone else, but they have a radically different health expression? Are you eating the same foods as say someone in the same house, but they seem to be metabolizing them better and you're not? Are you, can you eat, uh, like if you eat the proverbial little muffin and you put on one to three pounds of weight in one day, even though that muffin, unless it was last year's regifted Christmas fruit cake, it didn't weigh one to three pounds. The, that, that muffin triggered a new a massive inflammatory response in which your body retained water and you swelled, swelled up. And that's, that's what people can like, if you're one of these people that puts on weight really rapidly and, and it goes down rapidly, that's inflammatory water weight. So whatever triggers inflammation, that's a genetic issue. And there's certain lifestyle diet, uh, supplements, et cetera, that can help reverse the effects of that. Now, the, the test itself is super easy. It's a simple cheek swab. Simple cheek swab takes less than five, literally takes less than five minutes to do. 
sent, sent off to the lab, and then it gives you a lifetime of, of answers that you don't have to get tested on this again. So the beauty of genetics is that the genes don't change. And so it, this particular type of genetics test, you never have to redo again. So whatever you invest in, in genetics, you think of that amortized over 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60 years, however much longer you expect you're going to be living. Uh, the really, really, really good in-depth practical, usable genetics testing is so cheap. When you look at just the lifetime of information, actual information you're going to get. So is there such a things as bad genetics? Well, okay. Um, so I worked with this, uh, he, he was an international entrepreneur. Um, he was overweight. Uh, he was having panic attacks. He was drinking alcohol. Uh, he was, he was just, he wasn't doing well. Like he was really not healthy. He was basically probably 10 years away from a heart attack uh, or less. And when we got the genetics testing done for him, he was very sensitive to alcohol. He was on completely the wrong diet. Like, like he was on the wrong diet for his genetics. And, um, he was also, uh, he did some other things going on with his uh, thing, methylation pathways, which is a fancy way of saying how his brain dealt with uh, stress hormones, uh, amongst other things. And based on the genetics, changed the key things in his, in his lifestyle and diet, got him on the right nutrients based on the genetics testing. And no more panic attacks, off all the alcohol, dropped 27 pounds on the right diet. He is thrilled. Uh, absolutely thrilled. We didn't include his actual testimony in Hill, did we? No. Okay. Um, so he's, he's, he's absolutely thrilled about this. And that was just from the genetics testing. We didn't even do, we didn't do any of the other functional tests like adrenals, gut, mitochondria, liver, uh, et cetera, uh, thyroid. So the good news is, is that like those changes that he's made, like those are the changes that are hardwired that he knows that for life, he's got to stay on this trajectory because the genes don't change. And so now things are really clear. He doesn't get to have to be distracted by the shiniest new podcast or, or, or Dr. Oz show or, or whatever is on the latest news broadcast, miracle supplement this or whatever. Um, it's just stick, sticks to his genetics. Uh, now I, I was one of those people. I still am one of those people with quote bad genetics. Uh, in fact, uh, just to be really transparent. So I've done a lot of these tests and to date, I still hold the record for the most number of rogue or what are called variant genes, meaning like the number of bad air quotes, bad copies. I still to this day have the most number of bad copies of genes of anyone I have ever tested, which makes total sense to me why I was so sick growing up, despite everyone else apparently was much healthier, is because bad lifestyle choices or bad life circumstances, you know, a six-year-old eating, you know, SpaghettiOs and ramen noodles and just, and, you know, bagels and margarine, like, is that a choice or is that a circumstance? A six-year-old doesn't know anything about this. That's a circumstance. So my, um, my circ because of my genetics, my circumstances hurt me a lot more than other people because my, I was so vulnerable genetically. Uh, yet after a lot of work and you know, it's been basically a 25 year journey. When I was a teenager, I decided to take control of my health and deal with the severe crippling insomnia that was so bad it stunted my growth, deal with the terrible digestive problems, deal with the anxiety and the severe depression, deal with um, uh, the, the body pain that, uh, and the damage that I accrued from sitting too much playing video games or from the violence I experienced at school over a decade. Uh, it, uh, other things that we don't need to go into detail, but it's like just a lot of stuff that I've had to overcome despite having 
genetics and the, the genetics the, the way that I have. And so right now, so this is a picture. This is from New Zealand when I lived in New Zealand. This was the graduating class from my first stand-up comedy class. That's me and my, that's actually my grandfather's hat. Uh, uh, and this is Lily uh, looking very sleepy. This is from my first graduating class uh, here in Colorado, the stand-up comedy. Uh, this is actually me interpreting, impersonating David Attenborough. And in fact, uh, Crystal, if you would, quickly jump onto my YouTube channel and grab the link for my playlist to my stand-up comedy. Uh, Crystal will share a playlist I have on my YouTube channel that has about 10 clips from my first two shows in the States of stand-up comedy. If you want to see me do a pretty badass David Attenborough impression where I'm pretending to be David Attenborough narrating a wildlife special inside a Boulder coffee shop, uh, this is it. So you'll enjoy it. Uh, and so my, I'm way healthier, way happier, way more f functional citizen in society in my forties than I ever was in my teens, twenties and thirties. Uh, Cause I, my skill, my, my understanding of genetic, like I didn't get into genetics till I think it was like 2000, I think it was, you know, 2017, you know, 10 million years ago. Yeah. <laughs> Because we remember 2020 was the longest year on record. The longest year on record with, with absolutely no exceptions. <laughs> uh, yeah. So um, anyway, I, uh, so my basically saying through functional testing, genetics, et cetera, mm -hmm. and all the things I've learned therein, things have vastly improved. And I share that now with others. And so one one of the main people have heard this word inflammation. So the reason I'm bringing up inflammation is because it is so key to genetics. Um, so unbelievably key. So when I analyze it's what I've, so this is one of the things I've lectured on at genetics conferences on, on is on the role of inflammation uh, in people's health as it relates to weight gain. So I made an inadvertent discovery about the connections of inflammation and weight as one of the three uh, causes of genetic base weight. Oh, just get a drink there. My people are more vulnerable. People can have the same inflammatory circumstances or choices that they expose themselves to, but their response, their response to it can be completely different uh, based on their genetics. So some people have this kind of big lighter response. Some people have an inferno response where they overreact. I'm one of those people. I overreact to inflammatory lifestyle, diet, circumstances, choices, etc. cetera. A very, uh, yeah. Uh, too much will lead to an inferno of inflammation. And then it can also lead to chronic inflammation. So there's acute where it bursts up. And then if it doesn't get fully extinguished, it becomes chronic. So... Chronic inflammation all le also leads to stubborn weight gain. Now, there are different, like we mentioned before, there's different types of weight gain. Then there's three. We mentioned them. Mentioned there was three. Here are the three. Inflammatory water weight, hormonal toxic weight, and caloric fat weight. So, in brief, inflammatory water weight is where your body has a lot of inflammation and your body retains water in what's called the interstitial fluid. It's the fluid that between, it's between the cells because the body inflammatory chemicals kill cells. So if you dilute the inflammatory chemicals floating around the cells with more water, it's less likely those inflammatory cells will touch the cells and hurt them. So the solution to pollution is dilution. Same way with inflammation. So what happens is that you eat that mythical muffin and you swell up. Why do you swell up? Because it's not the weight of the muffin. It's the inflammatory chemicals in the muffin that then trigger your body's inflammatory response to dilute said inflammatory chemicals to do what? Buy the liver and kidneys time to filter out the toxic inflammatory chemicals. That's why you can swell up. And then over time, it, 
the weight drops because your liver and kidneys have had time to filter out, filter out, filter out the toxin. That's, that's the basic mechanism of it. Uh, there's actually, you, you know, these um, like tinnitus scales and these cool kind of scales that tell you like your water weight percentage and like your weight, your muscle mass, like they've got like your bone weight, your, like there's these fancy scales you usually see at, at gyms and stuff. There's a really interesting test to see if you are reactive to certain foods that are inflammatory is you weigh yourself not to look for weight, but to look for percentage water. And then you eat the thing. I can't, you eat the food and then you wait. I, I have to check the timeline. It's something like 30 minutes or two hours later, go back on and check to see if your water percentage has massively increased because you've retained more water to deal with the inflammation. Then there's the hormonal toxic weight. And this has to do with um, the liver detox genes, particularly the genes that detox estrogen. So um, one of the main reasons that people can put on weight is estrogen dominance um, or just baseline toxicity. Now, the, why does that happen? Is that when, um, when you have uh, toxic chemicals in your body, the, the fat cells are the dirty closets of the body. Just shove everything in there and keep it shut. And so if you, if you're having trouble losing weight, you may have a toxic layer of fat, but meaning that the body is afraid of opening that, that dirty closet, because as soon as you pull those toxins out of the fat cells are now in circulation and are dangerous again. So, uh, and, I'll, and I'll give a very real example. When I was in chiropractic school, uh, one of my friends, Jim was the pilot for 20, 30 years before he shifted careers to become a chiropractor. He got, uh, I think it was in his like seventh trimester or something. He got very ill from something. I think it was food poisoning. And he lost a tremendous amount of weight very rapidly. And what happened is that he lost all of the short-term memory to the point where he couldn't remember where he lived. What happened? All the toxic stuff as a pilot, the fuel, the cleaning solvents, everything in the, the piloting industry was released all at once. And those things are usually fat soluble. And where did they go? Into his brain and hurt his brain. Like this, not good to be in graduate school and suddenly have no short term memory. So that, that's why the body is so cautious about releasing toxic weight which is why doing a detox is not always the best idea until your body is ready for it. The other thing is the caloric fat weight. This is the type of weight most people think weight fat is, weight is, and it's the least common, least common. The, the most of the weight I have seen on people by far is inflammatory water weight, by far. Second place is hormonal toxic weight. Distant third is the caloric fat weight. Some people do put on fat based on calories. But I'd say that it's just a layer, a smaller layer relative to the inflammatory water weight and the hormonal toxic weight. Now, future-proofing your brain. Uh, I talked about neurodegeneration, uh, Alzheimer's, dementia, stroke, memory loss. These are all really relevant issues in my life, uh, both at their stroke and Alzheimer's and dementia on both sides of my family. Uh, so yeah, I have a professional and personal interest in this. So one of the perks of working with me is that I am acutely aware and interested in neurodegeneration, cardiovascular health, um, uh, and other kind of forward, you know, the future boogeyman that a lot of people are concerned about. Um, when, how did, when looking at your brain, we have to look at diet, weight, free radicals, and cardiovascular health. Why cardiovascular health? Because your brain requires, it uses up 20% of your body's energy, which requires circulation, proper, really good, healthy circulation. You need the right diet are you keto, paleo, Mediterranean, or high carb? Because your brain lives off of your diet. Ideal weight, because <clears throat> if your weight is not doing well, then there's a whole bunch of downstream effects that affect, like if 
your, your weight actually may be symptomatic of what's going on in your brain. Like if you have an inflamed weight, you may have an inflamed brain. Uh, and free radicals, of course, is massive because a free radical, that's one reason, you know, they call them liver spots when people are older. That's what's happening is that your skin is a reflection of the health and quality of your fatty acids. Uh, the health and quality of your fatty acids of your skin is also a reflection of the quality of the fatty acids of your brain. So not, not to careen too far into anthropology, but one, uh, why is there such a fixation in health and beauty on skin quality? Anthropologically, what and and the perfume industry why were people so are so folks almost kind of like a primitive reflex so fixated on looking at someone's skin and looking and and concerned about their smell because as hunter gatherers we didn't like what did we have to measure someone's health just by looking at them you can get the quality of their fats and the quality of their brain by looking at their skin and how well they're able to detox or how toxic they are by their smell because if someone smells off at least there are as research also showing like how genetically compatible you are if you don't like their smell then you're very similar genetically but it's it, it yeah it, there's, there's some nerdy rabbit holes we can go down uh but free radicals affecting your fats that show up on your skin are also the same things affecting the fats in your brain so now the healthy choices that could be hurting you, um, the genetics test can also reveal not just about the type of diet, but also the type of exercise. There's some, the genetics can reveal a lot about what type of exercise is best for you. Not everyone needs super high intense interval training and not everyone is good for zone jogging, but there are people more genetically predisposed, predisposed to one or the other. Additionally, some people are just simply terrible at absorbing vitamin D from the sun. And they're kidding themselves or they think they're getting vitamin D because I get sunshine 10 minutes a day when I walk my dog. No, not going to happen. Not if you have a, you know, you know, the majority of those eight genes between the sunlight and your blood to make vitamin D, much less the other three genes to make, to turn the vitamin D transported into the cells themselves. So how do you figure this all out? Well, there's genetic testing lab package. So there's five genetic profiles as a part of this cluster. The achieve your, the, there's the achieve your natural weight. That is, that is also the future proof your brain, the uh, stop the effects of aging air quotes test. It's the one that checks the cardiovascular system, inflammation, free radicals, liver, methylation, fat and energy metabolism, etc. Find your ideal diet. That's your carb tolerance. Understand your trigger foods. That's your relationship to gluten, lactose, caffeine, alcohol, salt, histamines, and other food allergens. Vitamin D absorption, those 11 genes I've mentioned already before. And then because we we're currently in the plague, uh, there's, there's an immune support genes, which, which pulls uh, over 30 genes and organizes them by how to support your immune system. So this can be a really huge relief if you know and understand all of your genes because so many mysteries are unraveled like the, the i'll tell you what the ideal diet tests alone i wish i had that 20 years ago that would have solved so many i had terrible digestive embarrassing like empty yoga room embarrassing digestive problems that i could not solve and i've tried all these different approaches to diet and probiotics and it's all and it wasn't what it turned out was that even though I had the most Portlandia diet, Mediterranean diet ever, where I knew the names of the chickens and the quinoa was picked on a full moon by left-handed monks on a Tuesday, you know, and it was soaked and all the rest. It just doesn't matter. It was too many carbs. Not, it wasn't a quality issue. It was a quantity issue. Within one week of changing my diet to my genetic potential, to my genetic capacity, all my digestive problems with 20 years went away. All of them. One stinking week when I changed it to what my genetics said, one week. So uh, people want to get involved in genetics for different reasons. One is that they're dealing with something now 
One is that they're confused about what they're doing now. The other is they're afraid of something happening to them in the future. So right now, as they're dealing with chronic inflammation, they're confused. The healthy choices like the diet, they're confused about what they're doing now. They want, just want clarity. The third type of person is I'm scared of turning into what happened to my grandmother or my grandfather. Uh, so all, all these three situations, genetics apply. So ge mainstream genetics uh, is really problematic because you, you get a 23 mean ancestry and then you get this vomit of information. You may put it through some algorithm on your iPhone, but what happens is that you don't get the information personalized and prioritized to you. What you get is an algorithm, which is not nothing. It's not nothing. There's algorithms are better than just here's all the raw data. Good luck. Enjoy. Algorithms are helpful in initial sorting, but it's not, it's not you. It's, 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 uh, I've seen so many times people come to me with their 23 me or their ancestry. It's like, I'm overwhelmed. I'm confused. And frankly, I'm scared. I don't know what to do with all this information. I don't know what to do first. I don't know what's real. I don't know what's the highest priority. And I'm just getting anxious. Uh, what do I do? And so then I say, okay, no problem. We're just going to redo, you know, these swabs. Why do I redo them? One, well, the other little dirty secret is that you read the fine print of 23andMe. If you read it carefully, they only guarantee up to 95% accuracy, meaning that one in 20 genes they tell you is wrong in terms of is it uh, a green dot or a red dot or, or like is it a variant gene or not so the lab that i use um sorry for the noise outside uh the lab that i use they i've been in the lab i've seen the technology i can't talk about it because i'm in agreement not to but they get over 99 percent accuracy in fact to the point where they were able to tell that there were two uh two sets of genes on one swab when they were doing the, and how did that happen is that a mom was doing a test and she let the, the, the cotton swab lay out to dry and she went off and did something. Her, her toddler came by and she didn't know this, thought it was a lollipop and put an instant, oh, there's not much sugar on that and put it back. She didn't realize that. And so she sent the thing off to the lab and the lab called her. It's like, I think you have another set of DNA on this thing because they were so accurate. They could tell there was a second set of genes on there. Uh, so that that's one thing that's the other little dirty secret about the 23 and me people um is that look 19 out of 20 ain't bad but it's not good either when one in five one uh, five percent of the genes they're reporting they don't guarantee being accurate so now what um because everyone's current situation is unique um uh i've created an easy pathway for you to get the answers that you need and the best part is that it's free and all you got to do is book a health strategy call. Really straightforward. We'll talk about your current health challenges and frustrations, uh, what you've tried before, how many, like, <laughs> how many goji berry themed supplements you've, you've tried squirting up your nose. I've been there. Uh, how, many, how genetics can help you. And of course, next steps. So the way to book, it's really straightforward. You go to drsamshay.com forward slash health strategy forward slash health strategy. You don't need to capitalize anything. So it's just, it's a hands for health strategy call. And this is what you'll, you'll be sent to this page. There will be a secure form to fill out, very secure form to fill out a tip of compliant, et cetera. Uh, if, if you use brave browser, uh, don't uh, for this case, switch to Chrome, Safari or Firefox. Uh, I'm a bigger fan of Firefox. Um, and cause brave for some reason doesn't populate this bit. I don't know why, but anyway, it is what it is. So you'll see this and then um, we'll have the chat and then see if genetic testing is appropriate for you because genes do hold hidden keys to your health and we'll see if this is the appropriate next step for you. Uh, questions? Okay. So thank you for those that have popped questions into the chat throughout. Our first question I'm gonna put in the chat for you to read, uh, Dr. Sam, but it is how is the genetic testing for food sensitivity comparable to tests such as Wheat Zoomer and others that test for IgG and IgA sensitivities? Uh, 
does Great. it for specific foods? Great question. Um, there, there, it's a different window into food sensitivities. So uh, I, I'm very, very familiar with wheat sumer, Cyrex, Alcat, uh, Genova's uh, IG4, IgG4 finger protect. There's, there's, there's a multitude of different food sensitivity uh, companies and tests out there. I've tried basically all of them. Uh, and I actually interviewed Roger Deutsch, uh, who's the uh, person who directs the Alcat um, tests uh, when I had a radio show back in Wellington. Here, here's the differences. Um, so genetics, so the genetics testing, is, I'll show you the, uh, I'll just take the lactose. So in, in the genetics test, you can have, you'll show, are you, there's two main genes for lactose tolerance. If you are vulnerable genetically to lactose, uh, that means that you're vulnerable to lactose. Now, does it mean that if you're not vulnerable to lactose, that you're, that you're just have a free pass on dairy? That's a no, because there's other things that you have to check in lactose if you are genetically vulnerable. So for example, people can be vulnerable to whey and casein, two of the proteins in milk. The genetics testing at this time checks only for the lactose portion of it, not the whey and casein. So I have always been intolerant to milk. And yet, strangely, I am completely lactose tolerant. Which And so why is that? Because when I ran uh, Alcat testing, I had massive reactions to casein and whey, which explain why my mother growing up was so frustrated that she bought the fancy, expensive lactate milk, and it still caused me all of these problems because lactose wasn't the issue. It was the other proteins. Um, the, the other things about the IgG testing is that it's testing for, um, if for wheat, for gluten, for example, the genetics test that I do is checking for genetic vulnerability to celiac, which is very meaningful for the people that comes up positive. Even if you test negative for the genes for celiac, you can still be reactive to wheat because wheat, because modern wheat especially, can still be laced with all sorts of toxic chemicals like Roundup and or really high concentration in lectins because modern wheat, which came out of the dwarf wheats, modern wheat, excuse me, modern wheat in Canada, US, Central South America, Australia, New Zealand, came from the dwarf wheat species cultivated in 1951 with, uh, by an Australian scientist, has a much higher lectin, much, much higher lectin content than the artisanal wheat uh, strains out of Europe because in Australia, they were trying to find a wheat crop that was pest resistant because they would lose 25, 50% of their crops to pests, which in the post-World War II era where everyone was afraid of another war creating another massive wave of starvation or food shortages, it made sense to cultivate wheat that was resistant to pests, not seeing the long-term downstream consequences of much worse digestive disruption and chronic health issues from said pest resistant wheat. Long story short, the genetics will give you one meaningful window into food intolerances. Other food intolerance testing will give you another window in. Great, thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Okay, so the next question is, how are you able to differentiate between inflammatory water weight, hormonal toxic weight, and caloric with results from the genetic tests? Okay, very straightforward. Um, you, I look at the genes and clusters. So you look at the inflammatory gene, there's 15 major inflammatory genes. And then I also, within the other parts of the test, I have pulled out four others of the 60, those 64 genes in that section of the test that are the major, 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 major inflammatory genes. And what we're looking for are not individual genes, we're looking for patterns. So of the 19 genes, do you have 10, 12, 15 of them that are, you know, are rogue variant genes. That's a clustering. In the liver detox, I'm looking for, again, is there not just an individual gene of the eight major liver detox genes, but do you have clusterings of rogue genes? Fat and energy metabolism. There's 16 
of those 64 genes are just devoted to fat and energy metabolism. I'm looking for specific clusters of those genes in that. And I know you didn't ask about cardiovascular health, but if someone of the eight major cardiovascular health and blood sugar, blood pressure control genes on cardiovascular, if someone has like one out of seven, I'm really not that worried. If they have six out, it's like one out of eight. I'm not that concerned. If they have six out of eight, yeah, that person has a lot of concerns around their cardiovascular future. So I'm looking for clustering. So I see very distinct patterns and not to get too granular, but there's also sub patterns within. So it's not just looking at those first 19 inflammatory genes. There's actually sub clusters within those 19 genes that are also very meaningful in terms of how how they ramp up inflammation. Same thing in the fat and energy metabolism. They're not all 16 genes are weighted equally, particularly when taken in clusters. There, there's certain, like the satiety genes, like how full you feel, like those are four specific genes. Uh, how well you burn fat for energy is five genes. How well you burn of those 16. How well you burn fat for heat is two of those genes. So clustering matters. So when I see someone's gene test and I'm looking at those 19 inflammatory, the eight liver detox, the 16 fat and energy, I'm looking for patterns and sub patterns and then priorities. And then I look at how are people responding in their day and how are they presenting and how do they respond to certain things in their daily life? Do they pass the muffin test? They eat a little bit of muffin, they swell up immediately. That ain't calories, that's inflammation. There's no way that's a calorie. Impossible. Uh, it's, it's inflammation. So um, that's, that's what I look for. Also, other, other things to look for with inflammation, if someone over exercises and they put on weight, that's a dead giveaway that they have a pro-inflammatory windup because they, they overshoot their exercise capacity and then suddenly becomes pro-inflammatory and the body does the exact same thing it does like it was dealing with a muffin. And it floods the body with inflammation. And, sorry, floods the body with water, uh, retains water in order to dilute the toxic inflammatory chemicals. That, that's actually what I lectured on in the genetics conferences was on um, uh, exercise-induced weight gain based on the, and it was, it was such a, I won't go into the details, but it was like, that's what got me on the stage was because that's weird. Oh, and here's the pattern. Oh, and look, I'm implemented the pattern. And oh my God, this guy lost 40 pounds in one month following my protocols. The other guy lost two pounds a week for 16 weeks straight, you know, because I did an anti-inflammatory protocol, not a eat fewer calories, exercise more protocol, which has been the worst thing possible for him, for them rather. Same, uh, yeah. Okay, yeah. I can speak from, I got this testing done as well. And having Dr. Sam's experience synthesizing it all into those patterns and then having it come through as layman's term just like gave me all the, the clues personally I was looking for too. Okay, so the next question is, what genetic variants are responsible for creating differences between vitamin and mi micronutrient levels in the blood versus the levels actually present within the cells? Okay. Um... I'm going to give, I'm going to give what seems like a throwaway avoidant answer, but is actually true, which genetic variants are responsible for creating differences between micro levels, et cetera. The answer is all of them. The, 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 I'm not trying to cop out. It's just like, what do genes, what is, what is the biochemical representation of genetic variants? You have different biochemical ratios and things in the cells and in the tissues. That that's how genetic, how is genetic variance expressed by differences in compositions um, in the cells and in the tissues. So in terms of which ones are the most important, um, differences between vitamin and micronutrient levels in the blood, okay, actually present in the cells. All right, so this is, this is where we're getting into, um, give me, give me, hold, give me a second to think of how to answer this. Um, okay. So th th there's, there's another question underneath this question, which is how do you know what nutrients you need? Because what's floating in the blood as potential nutrition for the cells versus what is actually in the cells, because 
what's in the blood is basically a highway. People don't buy food off of the truck speeding down the highway. The truck has to go off the ramp, go into the store and offload the thing onto the shelf. That's the oxygen coming off the red. It's, it's, that's, that's the nutrients coming off the blood highway, going into the cells and, and depositing into the shelf in air quotes. Hold on, I'm just going to close the door because of a leaf blower. There, now I can think better. So, so where the genetic variations come in are what's the off-ramp look like? What type of trucks you got? How big is a store shelf? How big is a store? Like, and, and the actual nutrients, like all the actual nutrients, things that are delivered to the store shelves are different based like like none of the different they're affected by all the underlying infrastructure to deliver them to said shelves and that's that's where genetics comes in how do you measure the nutrients in the blood versus what your cells actually need okay genes don't tell you what your vitamin d level is now it'll tell you how readily available your potential is to absorb and make vitamin d but it will never ever tell you what your vitamin d level is now your genes will tell you are you able to easily quench free radicals in your mitochondria and there's three genes specifically mn sod catalase juglathione peroxidase one if you want to get nerdy about it but it will tell you your capacity and potential and how much support you'll need, but they do not measure the actual levels of free radical damage in your cells now. I mean, that's what functional testing is for. That's, I mean, the, the markers for checking for free radicals, you know, it's, it's a Scrabble word, but 8-hydroxydeoxyguanosine, that's on the advanced mitochondria functional test that requires a liver, uh, sorry, that is, it requires a urine and blood test that tells you what the thumbprint of your biochemistry is now. So how do you know what nutrients you have in the blood? Well, that's a blood test, but how do you know what's been in the cells? Well, we, we don't do a biopsy of a single cell. We don't have needles that small, but what you do do are check the, it's an emissions test. So the mitochondria test is a mixture of blood nutrients in the blood, plus an emissions test in the urine of how much has been used in the cells, like an emissions test in your car, you can tell from the exhaust from the cells of what your body has been using. And that's how you know the nutrient requirements in the cells, not from opening the cells themselves because we don't have the technology to do that. But what we do do is we can check the emissions and that's what functional testing is for. So ideally people do both genetics and functional testing, but genetics is one of those tests where you can do at any point at any time and you have the information from your, for your life from that point onward. And so for some people, like that's really where they want to start. And that's fine to start. And if, if you do genetics and you implement all the lifestyle changes and everything should be working in like two months, four months in, and it's not working, then you pivot to, okay, there's something blockading. Do you have a hidden infection in your gut? Has your adrenals collect? Like there's no genetic test we know of for adrenal issues. Not that, not that I've seen. Uh, there's, if the genetics isn't working and then it, and if it's not, uh, then you have to look at other reasons blocking the effects of the, the genetics change, the lifestyle changes. So this happened with a client of mine. It's like she was doing all the right things based on her genetics. Things weren't shifting and we pivoted to adrenal and gut. And sure enough, she had, a meaningful adrenal issue and really meaningful gut infections that were creating all of this inflammation in her body. And we were doing all the things to lower inflammation, but we weren't getting rid of the cause of the inflammation in her body at that time, which was rampant infections in her intestinal lining. So we were just doing band-aids until we got more information through a stool test. So then once she's finished with removing these infections and all the rest of it, then the genetic stuff we go back to, because that's, that's locked in for life when we just remove the temporary blockades through functional testing. So we have one more question. It's actually very related to what you just went through. And that okay. is, does genetic testing reveal parasites or leaky gut problems? What it, it does not reveal an ounce of, if you have a parasite, not one, because that would, you're not running genetics testing on 
not on the uh, infections. What you what it will reveal though is how exuberant your inflammatory response is, and how much more. So, for example, like I, uh, how much more vulnerable you are to inflammation caused by the leaky gut, and also reveal what type of lifestyle changes you can do to help heal your gut faster. But it doesn't tell you if you have infections, like with this client. So, but what we can do based on her genetics is alter her lifestyle diet and supplement program based on her genetics to accommodate for her exuberant inflammatory response, because to deal with a leaky gut, you need to deal with inflammation. So for me, when I ran my genetics, I have a terrible, terrible high amount of inflammatory markers. And my, I don't put on weight because I have other genes that make me burn fat really fast and other genes that help me deal with water retention. But the inflammation goes to my brain to make me really moody and cranky and have insomnia. And it goes to my joints for joint pain, like an old man. So my inflammatory response is not weight, it's pain, insomnia, and depression. So when I saw my genetics, I got on you know, people think, oh, I just need a gram of fish oil. No, I needed six grams. Okay. Now don't, do not go out and get six grams of fish oil. Don't do not do that right now. You, you need to have testing. You need to have oversight. If you do too much fish oil, you can get thin blood and have clouding problems and all the rest of it. I had the test. To sh okay. I, I went hard into fish oil and all my joint pain finally went away because I genetically need way more fish oil than the average person. And that's the thing that genetics can reveal is dosage, dosing, which then can, you can, if you, with that in mind, you can use leverage that to help deal with leaky gut and all these other issues. If you're, if you want to know if you have uh, parasites or leaky gut, you need a stool test. And then the stool test that I like to run actually checks for infections using genetic technology, but specifically genetic tags for the parasites and infections, et cetera, in the stool. Beautiful. Well, that puts us about just two minutes over. Um, thank you, Dr. Sam, for your font of wisdom, always. Font. <laughs> your wealth of wisdom. My font of wisdom. Uh, it's not Wingdings font. Fountain. <laughs> fountain, okay. Oh, uh, one more question. Is any testing covered by insurance? Uh, not mine. Yep, which is pretty typical in the functional medicine space. Yeah, no, I'm unfortunately, it's, um, it's very unfortunate, but it's the universe we play in. Yeah, but that is exactly, I mean, those kind of questions are great for the free health strategy call. If you do think of any other personalized questions to your circumstance, this is literally a free chance to sit one-on-one -on -one with Dr. Sam to talk about your personal scenario. So we really do encourage you, this is just the easiest way to get the process started and to explore whether genetics really makes sense for you. So we encourage you to go ahead and book your call. And we're so grateful that you're here for us with us today. Um, if you ever have any other questions about overall services or anything, you can contact us at support at drsamshay.com. I'll just pop that into the message. And in the meantime, again, thank you so much. And we hope you enjoy the rest of your day. Yeah, thank you all. Really appreciate it. Keep in touch through our newsletters. There will Lily be says bye. <laughs> Lily bye. says bye. Uh, we'll have monthly webinars. That's pretty much our schedule. So if you like, if you like this topic, be sure to come back for more, okay? Thank you so bye. much. Bye.